My favorite movie of all time is Hollywood Shuffle. And I think sadly, <laughs> sadly, almost all, if not all, of that film resonates today, which I think is a terrible indictment on many things, but also shows the film's brilliance. That being yes. said, that being said, with Boys in the Hood, and then you're also in South Central as well. How did you as an actor like because in one of the themes in Hollywood Shuffle, of course, is Bobby Taylor trying to be a real actor, and all he's getting is are these demeaning roles. For you, uh, being Monster and then being Ken Dog in South Central, did you worry about typecasting? Did you say, "Man, I'm only I'm not a gang member, but this is what they want me to be on screen"? Like, how did that work for you in a parallel world to what Hollywood Shuffle was saying? I looked at it on both, both perspectives. One was, oh man, I, you know, I was in college productions that w were Shakespearean, or I played a businessman. I did a play called uh, Women of Manhattan, where I played a guy named Duke that, that smoked a pipe and was very intelligent. And I felt like, man, you know, you're giving me this role. And I said, but it is acting because you're not a gang member. You can mimic the environment you grew up in. Uh, I based the character of Monster on two uh, gentlemen that grew up in my community um, who unfortunately met an untimely demise because they were gang members. But I took Monster and created him based on those two individuals. I could mimic my atmosphere or my environment. Um, but then the other way I looked at it was, hey, I can do so many other things. You know, if I feel like if you can do Shakespeare, you can do anything. And so... I was like, man, how long am I going to continue to do these roles? Um, and I did turn down a couple of roles um, after South Central because I was like, OK, how long can I keep playing the bad guy and be stereotyped? Um, you know, um, so, you know, that it was it was on both sides that I looked at it, that it really was acting for me. I'm not a gang member, never have been. Um, but at the same time, it was like, why are these the only roles I'm given an opportunity to do? when I can do so much more. So it was twofold for me. And after uh, Boys in the Hood and South Central, you didn't do as much stuff. Was that the reason why? Or did your, I know, I, of course, you, you also are a case manager at Crittenden Services, which you've been doing for close to 30 years now. Is, yes. So did that, how did that start? And is that why you stopped acting? Or did the lack of, uh, quality roles reduce mm -hmm. your acting like what was happening well what went on was uh when i started just doing the gang roles i was like okay um do i even want to go in and read for this film i mean i may get it but it's the same type of character um i'll still go in and read because relevance is the key in hollywood trying to keep your face out there and then i'll just have to either have a manager to help me kind of change my image or try to read for films that are going to give me a different opportunity. So originally that was my goal. I did, you know, turn down a few things. Um, I still tried to stay around the business. Uh, I did a lot of commercials and um, I tried to stay around the theater. Um, but with that being said, I also became a father. And that was when life really opened my eyes that if you're not getting the acting roles that you once got, you may have to find a job to where you can still audition and act. Um, I never wanted to be a waiter or, uh, or anything like that. I was like, I could get a job that would kind of function as a waiter. I could work on Graveyard because that was originally how I came into Crittenden. Um, and then I could still audition during the day and also be a, a dad during the day. Um, you know, so originally that was the goal. Um, and I would still audition, but I started getting uh, less roles. Um, and I said, okay, I got to earn a living. So then I transferred from graveyard shift to a more primary shift, which we call swing shift. And I was given a lot of opportunity to speak. Um, I developed trainings on gang awareness, um, professional boundaries, because there's only 5% male <laughs> in that field. There's 95% female. And people wanted to know, well, you know, what's it like to work with girls or women? Um, and, you know, there's certain situations that are presenting that could cost you your job. 
And I gave them the tools that I use. And they said, you ought to make that a training. So I did. And I created the training for any male that followed behind me working in this craft um, because it can get challenging. Um, and so um, very important to, to, to do that. So I just kept uh, honing my craft with Crittenton and, and the social work sphere and trying to still cook in Hollywood, but I just wasn't getting the roles. Um, and so um, I am still in the union, uh, year 32 now. And so here and there I get roles. And I did not easily broke in Ranchero, a couple of roles after, nothing major, but I'm still trying to keep my head, my, my uh, hat in the fire, so to speak. I'm, I'm never going to stop acting. I'm going to keep, uh, you know, grinding and keep trying to continue to, to hone my craft. So that's kind of what happened there. Yeah. And not easily broken is uh, Bill Duke directed that, and it stars among yes. others Morris Chestnut and Taraji P Henson. Did yes. uh, you and Morris Chestnut get any Boys in the Hood uh, reminiscing on on not easily broken? <laughs> well, what's funny is uh, Boys in the Hood was Morris and I's first film, and um, we ended up connecting over uh, Madden football, which is a video game playing football. Um, and then we connected on basketball. Uh, we started talking about our love for it. Um, and so we would play uh, in like celebrity basketball games together. And then obviously we would play Madden football together. And we have been friends ever since. We've been good friends. I talked to Morris uh, probably at least three, four times a week. Um, you know, it would be unusual not to talk to him that often. That's how close we, we've become over the years. But Boys in the Hood was... Uh, both of our first films and we've been friends ever since so when not easily broken uh script came out and he shared with me about the project you know um there was a basketball scene and he was like hey b you should do this you know this will be fun and this you know it would be one of our old school connections again and so i said i'm in and i went in an addition i got the part and um, was able to to work with him and we just laughed about it um, and, and we have goals now to try and find something else in the future. Um, Morris is quite busy, very, very active. Um, and we're still trying to keep that that connection going 32 years later. That's amazing. Yeah, the Best Man series they just did on Peacock. I watched that. He's great in yes. that, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill Duke, a friend of the show and the channel of mine, he directed. Awesome. Now he's, you can check out my interviews with Bill up there. Okay. Um, okay. That being said, um, with uh, social work and being a case manager, how did all of your life prepare? How did you even get this opportunity? Because you had told me also when we had talked one time that you had gotten this offer basically during the Boys in the Hood promotion. Yes. <laughs> so before Boys in the Hood came out, they sent it through what's called testing. They wanted tests from people that saw the movie to see where could we have made it better? Do we need to go in and edit it? Um, people loved it. Um, so they chose to show it a week before the premiere at juvenile hall detentions. Um, there's a juvenile hall, and this will date it. Uh, it was called McLaren Hall. It's no longer uh, functioning. In fact, the other one we saw it at Los Padrinos in Downey, California, is also no longer around. But McLaren Hall was in Los Angeles and they showed the movie. And it was interesting because the guys that kind of had questions for me, because we did a Q&A session after the film show, the guys that had questions for me, uh, the staff will come over and say, hey, those are our hardest guys. They're never interested in anything. I don't know what it is about you, but you need to come work here. Because I would answer their questions. And I think they were wondering, like, OK, you're from Compton, but you're an SC graduate, but I'm watching you on film and you're killing people. So I think it was just really uh, interesting to them, maybe a little confusing. And so they would ask questions and I would answer them. And I think uh, those answers, uh, you know, resonated for them. Um, and so the lady offered me a job there, but I wasn't ready yet because I was still working in Hollywood. Um, at that time, I had went from uh, boys to South Central. I did class act with Kid and Play. Um, 
And another film called The Hank Gathers Story, a basketball film based on the life of the great Hank Gathers. Um, so I was working. So I was like, OK, I don't I don't maybe later I may need to fall back on something, but I'm not ready yet. Um, and then later, uh, ready popped up. And that's when I applied at Crittenden. Um, and so um, I was hired there. Um, and that that's when it presented itself. Um, I looked at the job as being a role model. I looked at the job as being a mentor, a big brother uh, and a teacher of life skills. And so um, once I started gathering uh, the impact of how I could help a lot of those young uh, boys and girls slash men and women, because I work with adults now, uh, which are former foster youth between the ages of 21 through 25 years old. Once I learned that I could make a difference, uh, it just, it resonated with me. It, 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 believe it or not, it's like my Hollywood. I love Hollywood. And I'll never give, it, give that up, but I love this career too. Very redeeming. You make a difference. Um, I have clients that I worked with 18, 19 years ago. They call me and their parents now. And they say, hey, I remember you and some things you shared. I never had a father, but I felt like you were a father type figure uh, that resonated with me. Um, and I even have had staff call me and say that they respected, you know, working with me and some of the life lessons that we discussed and worked out along the way. Yeah, well, that's amazing. And uh, congratulations on that. And you. you're welcome. And with uh, growing up in Compton and now being the case manager, and doing social work, how have you seen, how is the landscape in the neighborhood the same and how is it different? Uh, it's different now because the way I see gangs functioning now is more economic driven. Um, like, you know, the, the drug trade, um, there's taxes being paid in certain areas that some gangs can sell the drugs out of, some can't. Um, the same with uh, human trafficking. Um, their, their hand is in that now, too. So it's more economic driven. Whereas when I was growing up, you could have the wrong color on. You could they would hit you up. Yo, where you where you from, where you live? And it might cost you your life if you didn't give them the right answer. Um, so it's more economic driven now as opposed to territory driven. Um, I think another thing is different about it also is. Um, you have a lot of different types of people that are now gang members. You kind of had an idea back in my day growing up. Now, uh, there's guys as young as nine years old that can be in a gang. And there's guys as old as 60 years old that can be part of the gang. But they're subdivisions, meaning I'm 60, I'm the OG. I'm calling the shots. If I'm nine years old, then I'm a courier. I'm running drugs across the way, weapons, or um, if I have to put in work, I'll do it. So someone over 18 won't get as harsh a punishment as I would get. So that's how the game has changed uh, in that way. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, to me, it's more economic driven. Interesting. And then entertainment wise, how have you seen a change from, the way people of our age, our generation looked at rap and film versus what you see with the kids you've been interacting with the last 30 years. How has that changed to what they, how they view entertainment? Uh, Cause we looked at stuff as reality rap, you know, yeah. yes. how, how do the kids and what have the people you work with, how have they seemed to evolve and how they, digest, ingest, and then process what they're seeing on television, what they're seeing on their phone, what they're seeing, uh, hearing musically? Well, they're drowned in it. You know, back in our day, you were lucky to have, you know, um, I'm going to age myself here. You were lucky to have the uh, hanger on the TV with the aluminum foil on it so it can work just to get basic uh, channels. Nowadays, you can turn on uh, cable or uh, you could stream and have access to any channel you want, including other areas and countries, depending on what you're streaming. So you're uh, inundated in entertainment now. Um, again, financially driven, it's different. Um, so everything gets cranked out a little faster. 
And unfortunately, sometimes when things are cranked out faster, they're not done as well. Um, and so I think uh, what you have now is just everything is financially driven, cranked out faster, and the kids are no different. Um, I call this era the microwave uh, era. Um, I remember being a kid making Jiffy Pop popcorn, having to wait 20, 25 minutes and, and happy when it came out in 20, 25 minutes. Kids now throw it in the oven, BB, go pick up their phone, come back. It's ready two minutes later. Um, it's the same way with the entertainment. They're getting a lot of a quick things that are fast. I mean, remember back in the day when we would have to wait, what, six months to a, uh, a year to get the DVD or the Blu-ray? Or even the VHS. Or with VHS, I was about to say. <laughs> oh, man. Now, I mean, they'll, it'll release one month and two weeks later, it, you know, you can stream it. This is the era we're in. Everything is just so fast. Um, it, it, it's uh, speed driven. Um, and what it's leading to is, in my opinion, it is kind of bringing down some of the quality. There's still good films being made. But um, an example is, you know, you might have a Spider-Man one through six. You know, you might have a, uh, well, we got uh, Black Panther and then Wakanda too. And that's fine. They're good products. But it's like, okay, after five, you know, should we now move on to something different? There's other stories out there, um, a lot more. And so I think that's where we're hurting ourselves. I think there's some amazing stories out there. I have a couple of buddies that are writers, amazing content, but those stories aren't being told because they're considered new projects they're not a sequel or they're not as popular um but uh the product or the project it's like this is amazing this is something everyone should see um and they're just not being made um it, it's not gonna be able to to be translated into a film fast enough and it may not be as profitable so that's where um not only is the industry that way but our kids are that way you know, everything is TikTok, YouTube. I don't even think teenagers watch TV anymore. It's all about TikTok, YouTube. Um, let's see, what's the hot video games now? Obviously, Xbox. But you have Roblox. I mean, that uh, I never knew what Roblox was. And then you see these kids just, just for hours playing Roblox. Um, this is the era we're in. Um, a lot of inundation of media and entertainment. That is for sure. So there it is. So Baldwin Sykes, thanks so much for coming through to Unique Access. Anything else you wanted to add or where people could check you out or learn more about what you're doing? I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to come in. Um, I am a, a case manager at this time, working with Credenton Services as a case manager. I'm a trainer. Uh, I train anything from active shooter trainings to gang awareness. And as I stated earlier, professional boundaries for males that are working in a female dominated field and understanding their role and how they can be effective um, as a teacher of life skills. Um, as an actor, I'm actually seeking a new agent at this time because my agent um, is a little older now and kind of stepped aside from, um, from uh, you know, the Hollywood thing. So I'm, I'm seeking a new agent so that I can audition and give you guys some new projects um, such as Boys in the Hood and South Central and the other projects that I was blessed to work on. So that's where I'm at right now in my life. Um, and I'm just uh, grateful for every opportunity that I get, whether it's in the social work sphere or in the entertainment sphere. Well, there it is. Well, Baldwin Sykes, thanks so much for coming through, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for 
just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the street. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.